Good. All right, now in Luke chapter 16, of course, we have this famous parable. I'm sorry, Luke 15. We have the famous parable, the, it's called the prodigal son. And um, that word prodigal, it's not used here in this, in this uh, parable, but it's what's referred to when referring to this parable. And I'm going to preach this whole sermon. Basically, we're going to go through verse by verse, kind of like we do on Wednesday nights. And I'm going to explain this, this parable of the prodigal son. Now, that word prodigal is not really used too much in our, in our vocabulary. It's most, the reason why most people even know it is just because they hear, oh, the, the, the prodigal son, the prodigal son. That word just means like, like lavish or that he, you know, basically this is the story of the son that went out and he wasted his inheritance. He, he lived up the life, right? He spent all that money. And that's what prodigal means is he's the son that just went out and, and had this, um, this lavish lifestyle and just spent all this money and just and spent himself broke with his inheritance. So, but we're going to go through this. Now, the key to understanding this parable starts off in verse number 11 when he's just starting to get into the parable. It says, and he said, a certain man had two sons. See, a lot of people will, will try to use this parable for a work salvation and things like that. And what, what it's, it's always interesting to see, people who teach false doctrine, the vast majority of the time, the, the, the whole foundation of what they believe is coming from a parable. We believe a lot of things in the Bible, but our core doctrines and the foundation of our belief is not coming from parables it's coming from concrete, clear statements that are made in the Bible that, that are just unequivocal. You, just, you cannot argue against them. They're just flat-out statements and teachings in the Bible. Now, in, in, you know, in God's Word. But the parables are often used. They should help support your doctrine. And you can use the, the, the concrete evidence then to help interpret the parables, the things that you know for certain from God's Word, from the mouth of the apostles, from the mouth of Jesus Christ, these things that were that are that were laid out, not just a parable or story. Now you get a lot of meaning, a lot of a lot of um, you know, it's a good way of teaching using parables to help us understand things. But the thing is with parables, it's not literal the way that that other portion of scripture is, where you could just look at it and say, okay, yeah, this is exactly what it means. It's a story. So you have to have some level of interpretation of the story to understand what is the teaching, what's going on here in this story. And this is the story that people will go to to try to teach some kind of false, you know, works-based salvation and things like that. So they'll use this story to do that. But it's important right from the very beginning, it says a certain man had two sons. This story is about a, a father, right? He has, he has property, he's got a house, and he has two sons. The one stays with him and works and does hard work. The other one says, look, I want to have my inheritance now. I mean, in a family, you have, you know, your children will, will receive, typically they'll receive an inheritance after you pass on all the work that you've done, everything that you've tried to lay up for them, your property, your wealth, all the stuff you amass, when you, after you pass away, it gets passed on to your children. So the prodigal son here is saying, look, is dad still alive? He's saying, look, I want this now. I just, I just want my portion. Give me what's coming to me. I want it now. But it's important to understand that he's still a son. Okay, because this is the part that, that all the workspace salvation crowd fail to see. Is that once you're, and spiritually speaking, once you're born again, once you become a child of God, the same way that my daughters they're my daughters forever, no matter what. I mean, there, there's a blood relationship. They will be, they are my daughters no matter what they do, no matter how they act. If they leave the house, if they go off and live in sin, no matter what they do, they're always my daughters. And in this story, this man has two sons, okay? And no matter what he did, he was still his son when he was out living in sin and living in the world. He was his son. But let's get into this parable a little bit with that, with that in mind, his understanding, look, this guy that goes out and lives a wicked lifestyle, he's still a son of the father. Verse number 12 says, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. So he takes this wealth, right? The, the dad splits it up. Like we're at, at this point, he says, okay, this is where we're at. This is all my goods. Fine. You want your inheritance now? Go ahead. You can take it. Gives him his lot. He gives him his portion. I assume he gives it to him, you know, in money or whatever. 
you know, we have all these cattle, I'll just pay you this amount, this is what it's all worth, here's your inheritance, you can have it now. And so what does he do? He gets all his stuff together, he takes a long journey, gets out of his dad's house, right? And wastes all of his substance with riotous living. That word riotous, it's not like he was out, you know, getting fights in the street. Riotous just means it's like reckless. It's reckless living. He was out partying. Um, he goes out and, and his other, the other son later on in the parable says that, you know, he spent it with harlots. Now, we don't know 100% if that's true or not, but basically, he's going out, he's living a party lifestyle. He's probably going out and getting drunk. He's living it up. He's just wasting all this money, spending it. And I bet you, you know what? He was probably the life of the party, too. Right? I mean, everybody loves him. Here's this guy. He's got all this money, and he's throwing it around, and he's having fun. He's having a good old time, and he wastes his entire self. He's got nothing to show for it at the end of the day. He just goes out, has, has fun, enjoys the pleasures of sin for a season, goes out, sows his wild oats, has all kinds of fun, and wastes his substance. Now, this prodigal son, he wastes, this was his inheritance. So at this point, after he wastes it, he has no more reward. He has nothing else to look forward to. I mean, now he's at a point. Before he was, he was you know, he could work and do all this stuff, yet he still had this inheritance you know, that he can look to and look forward to receiving. He's already received that now. He's got nothing else to look forward to. But the son that did the will of his father, he still has a great inheritance laid up for him, if you think about that. Because the two sons went away. One stayed with his father. He stayed in the house. He's doing the work. The other one left. Now, we need to make sure, one of the things that we can learn from this parable is that the things that you do are not simply the rewards that you're going to have temporarily. This is what I was talking about a little bit this morning, when I preached this morning's sermon, that we're not focused on the things that we're just going to have in this lifetime, the things that we work real hard for, that we're just going to get and, and receive our reward immediately. Because what we want to do is we want to work and lay up these rewards based on a work that we're not going to receive immediately, something that we're going to receive later on in the future. It's an inheritance that we can lay up for ourselves. These rewards and these, uh, rewards and these treasures that we can lay up for ourselves in heaven where, where we won't lose them, nothing's going to happen. They can't just get wasted up with riotous living. In Matthew 6, verse 5, the Bible says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. This is just one section of a, of a long section of Scripture in Matthew 6 where he's basically explaining, look, these guys that go out and they make this long oration and they're in public and they're making these, these grand speeches and these prayers to look unto men like they're holy, well, in so doing, they're already receiving their reward. They're already just getting the benefit from that by, by getting people to look at them and be impressed with how they speak and just be impressed with how godly they look. He says, you know what? They have their reward. That is their reward. They're getting exactly what they want out of it, but they're getting nothing else. It's vain. They're not getting what they ought to get. See, here he's saying, look, but if you pray in your closet, don't do it in front of men. Don't do it to be seen, but do it just because you're praying to me because it's coming from your heart and you're not looking for those kinds of rewards. He says, your father would see it in secret. He sees you doing this stuff secretly. He sees how you're living your life. He sees you obeying the commandments. He said, he's going to reward you openly. Now, that may not be something that's going to come instantly. It's not this instant gratification. And this, unfortunately, is a type of, of world that we live in today. We live in a world where people want to be gratified immediately. And, and it's, it's indicative throughout the entire society. Everything is done in our society to make things faster and quicker and easier and just, just more convenient. That's why we have all the fast food places. I mean, everywhere you go now, there is a chain of just fast food. You can just you say, you know what? I want to drive up and I want my food ready in like three minutes. That's I want to wait. I don't have time for this. I want to wait around any longer. I just want, I'm hungry. I want to eat. Give me the food right now. I'm going to eat it and just, and that's it. But the quality of that food is garbage. First of all, it's just a waste. You're getting, you're getting your instant gratification, right? You're getting something immediately. And yeah, it may be cheap or whatever, but you're just satisfying yourself just, just 
just immediately when if you were to take the time and you know and have actual real food prepared for you you're not going to get that in three minutes it's going to take a lot longer than that it's something that you're going to have to wait for the better the reward that you want the longer you're going to have to wait for it the more work and time is going to have to be invested in it now if you want something quick you just want to be inst instantly gratified yeah you can get that but you're not going to get the reward is not going to be nearly as great as the stuff that you work for and you earn and you put in a lot of time for so we need to make sure that the things that we really strive for and the things that we're really focused on are not going to be these things that are that are temporal that are short term that are just going to be burned up and we just and we have these things and they're just gone the next day we need to strive to make sure that, that the things that we're focused on have eternal value. Now, the prodigal son here, he decided to live for the moment and just have his reward immediately. He didn't want to wait. Now, if he would have waited, his reward would have been a lot greater. Because you think about it, who knows how old they were or anything like that. But there were probably many more years to come where he could have been working with his brother to just continue to build and amass way more wealth. So that when his father does pass on, they'll have a much bigger inheritance to receive instead of just wanting it immediately right now and just, and just not being patient and not being able to wait and not enduring and putting in the hard work. Because I guarantee you, the harder they work, the more things, that, the, the, the harder they strive and just have patience and just wait and say, you know what, I have faith, I know that, that I'm going to receive this, I don't need it right now, I'm just going to keep working and working and working and then later I'll receive it. This is the lesson, one of the lessons we could learn because you can't see the inheritance that we're going to receive in heaven. You have to, by faith, understand that they're there. But you need to not faint and not hold back and continue to work hard and not try to cash in on your rewards early because you're going to be losing out if you want to do that. Now, like I said, the prodigal son, he, had, he decided he wanted to live for the moment and just get his reward now and he ended up just wasting it and his entire reward just gone. His entire heritage has vanished away. In uh, Matthew 16, turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Keep a finger in Luke 15 because we're coming back to that. We're going through this entire parable. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 and I'll read for you from Matthew chapter 16. The Bible says, for what man, in, in verse 26, for what is a man profited? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. You see, we're going to receive a reward based on our works when Jesus Christ comes back. At the time of the rapture, when Jesus Christ comes back, there's going to be a judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to receive rewards. And I've brought this up, I think, in many sermons, but I don't know if I've ever actually turned there and explained it. That's why we're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It explains a little bit about this reward giving and about what we're going to get at the judgment seat of Christ. Look at verse number 9. It says, For we are laborers together with God. We're workers. We're supposed to be working hard with God. Says, ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. We're his workhorses. Where is that? We're, we're supposed to be out here working hard for the Lord and with God. Like as if God would be the one leading us and directing us and, 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 and you know, pushing us and showing us where to go. But we're working together with him. We're laborers with him. Look at verse number 10. It says, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So we see here the foundation that he's talking about building upon is Jesus Christ. Our foundation for the works, for all the things that we're going to build, for, for the work that we do, is laid up. It's, it starts off with our salvation. It starts off with Jesus Christ. You must be saved in order to continue to build anything that's going to last thereon. Look at verse number 12. It says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So basically he's saying all the work that you do in your life, after you get saved, you do, you do some kind of work in your life. 
right? All of the works that you do, they're going to be gathered together. You know, they're laid upon your foundation, upon Jesus Christ, upon your salvation. All the works that you do in your life, at the end of your life, when, when Jesus Christ comes back, at the judgment seat of Christ, they're all going to be laid up. Here's all your works. So maybe with your time, the work, some of the work that you did was you raised a family. Maybe some of the time you spent your time on some of the work that you did, you worked a job and you and you acquired whatever kind of wealth and things like that. You started a business, you built something, you created something. Um, you also went out soul winning. You know, you did these other things. And all this, all the time that you spend, all the work that you've done is all going to be massed up and just piled up. And the Bible says it's going to be tried by fire. So He said you can have, you know, whatever you build on that foundation. It may be gold. It may be silver, it may be precious stones, it may be wood, it may be hay, it may be stubble, all these different things that you could possibly do with your life, they're all just going to be set up here and it's going to be tried by fire. Now, if you're trying it by fire, of course, the wood, the hay, and the stubble is just going to be burned up because that's what happens to those things in the fire. But you can't burn, you know, the, the, the silver and the gold and the precious stones because it's going to make it through the fire. It's not going to be consumed. It's not just going to burn up. And that's what he says in uh, verse 13. It says, every man's work shall be made manifest. So it's going to be made known what you really did and what truly mattered of what you did. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. So he's saying, look, all the work that you do, if it abides through the fire, if it gets tried, and something that you did had eternal value, it made it through the fire, he said, you're going to receive a reward for that. God's going to bless you. He's going to give you, say, okay, well done. You did something. You did something of eternal value. This is great. Here you go. Here's a reward for that. And I think one of the reasons why God does this, why he gives us rewards for the good things that we do, is again to emphasize that salvation is a free gift. We don't do the things that we do that have eternal value because we're trying to pay God back for our salvation. Even though you ought to be thankful and be humble and willing and wanting to do as much as possible for God out of your thankfulness for saving your soul. I mean, that's a great attitude to have. But the thing is, you can never pay him back for what he's done because he's given you a free gift. You can't pay for it. So on top of that, besides him loving you enough just to pay for this for free, he says, okay, now anything that you do that's good, all the, all the things that you, the works that you do that have eternal value, I'm going to reward you for that. I'm going to pay you for that work that you've done because your salvation was free. I don't want you ever to think that the good things that you've done were a part of your salvation because they're not. He says, you get rewarded for this. And if you've done something that, that, that lasts the fire, that gets tried and has eternal value, you get a reward. But he also said, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. So all those things that you did, you know, at the end of your life, when you look back, or what, not, not just in your life, when, when this happens, when this day happens at the judgment seat of Christ, think about this. It's important to remember this because this is really going to happen. These are not just words that, that are just written in a book. These are events that are going to happen. We can see the future. We know the future right here. Knowing that this will happen one day, Think about that and put yourself there right now. Put yourself at the judgment seat of Christ. Think about all the works that you've done in your life. Think about everything you've done up to this point. And imagine if they were, if they were put in front of Christ and he tried them by fire, how much of those things would abide? How many of those things would last? Would anything last? How much stuff that you have done, that you have labored for, that you have worked for, for God, the work that you've done, how much of that would buy the fire? And if you think about it, if it's not very much, let that motivate you because that is what's going to stay with you forever. Everything else is just going to be gone. It's, it's, it's barely even going to be a memory. I mean, when you think of eternity, that's a long time to go. And to even be thinking back on, oh, I remember when I built, you know, when I made all this money, it's going to be like, well, okay, what good is that now? It's going to do you no good. Like, who cares, right? It's that you're probably not even going to care to think back to those times. It's going to be meaningless. 
the treasures that God will give us, and I guarantee you, are going to be way better than any treasure you could possibly amass to yourself in this lifetime. I, I don't know what they're going to be exactly, but I can't wait to see what they will be because I know that God is a giver of good gifts and that He is able to sit down in your chair, that He is able to give us good gifts and that we ought to um, think about that and think about this time that's going to come because it's going to happen, and, and whatever you've done to this point, hey, if you've done a lot of stuff that you think is going to buy the fire, great. Let's keep adding more to that. Don't quit now. Don't quit and say, well, I, I'm, just, I'm happy with that inheritance. I'm just going to stop now. No, keep building. Keep building more upon that because um, you might not know exactly what is and what's not going to buy it. Let's just keep pushing yourself to do that. Now, the prodigal son, he lived a riotous life. He really lived up, as I mentioned earlier, you know, he partied. I'm sure he just acted like a fool. And, um, you know, as I said, his brother said later in the parable, he devoured his substance with harlots. Now, um, look what happens, though, in verse 14. Look what happens after he runs out of money and his party life has to come to a stop. When, he, when he's just, he spends, he wastes all of his inheritance. Verse number 14 of Luke 15. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. So after he spends everything, now hard times come. Now there's a famine. Now it's hard to get food. And now he's in want, verse 15, and he began, or, or I'm sorry, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. So he meets up, there's another guy that's a citizen of that country, and he joins himself under this guy that's a citizen of the country. Basically, he gets hired to do some work, and says, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. So now he's got a new job of feeding the swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And see, this is where a life of sin is going to lead you. He ends up feeding the swine. Now, when I think about that job of, of feeding swine, I can't imagine it's a very clean job. I can't imagine it's a job that you would just strive for, just like, this is what I want to do with my life. I want to be feeding the pigs, Right? I bet you get pretty dirty doing that job. And I think this is a really good illustration. When you live that riotous life, when you go out and you do the party, now, you may think you're real clean. You're dressing up. You're going out to the club. You're doing all this fun. You're having a great time. In God's eyes, you're filthy. You're dirty. You're, you're living a wicked lifestyle. You're living this riotous life. And in His eyes, He looks at you just like you're, you're out rolling around with the pigs in the pig pen. And this is the view that God has when you live that sinful life. And when you go out and live this partying, riotous living, you're filthy. Now, I also bet that he had a lot of friends when he was out spending his inheritance, right? He was, like I said, it's probably the life of the party. He's probably out. He's probably out at the bar buying people drinks. Hey, this one's on me. You know, he's Mr. Moneybags. He's got all this money. He's going to go out and have a good time and just have a lot of fun. But look at what happens in verse 16 after this famine comes. Now, now he's broke, right? He probably had all these friends. He's out living it up. He's out having a good time. And sure, people would love to hang around with him while the money's flowing, while they can hang around and get something for free. You know, people who would probably just become his friends because he has money, because he's just out there, you know, wasting it and just having a good time. But as soon as that, that train ends, as soon as that party stops, he runs out of cash. What happens to those people? Well, look and see what happens to those people. Look at verse 16. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk of the swine. So he's so poor. He's out feeding the swine. He wishes he could eat the food that he's feeding to the pigs. He's feeding this slop, this, these husks to the swine. That's just the pig's food. And he's wishing that he could eat that food that the pigs are eating. This is the point where Zadon says that no man gave unto him. Nobody helped him out. Nobody was there giving him a healthy hand. You'd think that he would have acquired some kind of friends, but these are the type of friends that you get when you go out and live that riotous life. They're not true friends. They're not people that are going to be with you through thick and thin. They're just there when it's convenient for them, when they can get something from you, when you're living it up and the money's flowing and you're having this great time. Hey, when hard times come, where are they? The Bible says that no man gave unto him. He was allowed to get down to this point to where he's feeding the pigs. 
But look at verse 17. It says, And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. So it takes him this point. He has to come to himself. He has to just, just wake up and realize, What in the world am I doing? You know, it sounded like a great idea early on when he got his inheritance. I bet he had a lot of fun for a little while. He lived it up. He had to be brought low. He had to be humble. See, he had a bad attitude. He had this attitude of expecting something that was coming to him. You know, you should never have that type of an attitude of just expectation that someone owes you something or that you deserve this like he did with his father. Well, give me my portion of the inheritance. That's not very thankful anyways. Who is to say you even deserve an inheritance or you should get an inheritance, right? Who says you should get anything? But he was, he was more demanding. He had a poor attitude. And he finally comes to his life, finally realizes, you know, he was brought extremely low. And a lot of times, this is what we have to get to in our points too, in our, in our life, a point we have to get to in our life where, you know, you, you've sinned, you've done wrong, you've kind of strayed from God. Sometimes he may have to bring you low. Sometimes he may have to bring you to the pig pen and make you go through hunger, make you suffer things before you can come to yourself and just realize, like he did, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare? He's like, There's my, my dad employs so many people. They, they're fed well and they've got enough even to spare. So if he wanted to get something from them, hey, they even have enough to, to help him out. And I perish with hunger. It's like I'm dying here of a hunger. Yet at my father's house, there's a lot of people that are doing well. So he said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back there. And that's what he needed to do. It says, um, you know, the people in God's house. Now think about this too. Because this is a contrast between where he is. He's off in the world. He went way, he went far away. Right? The Bible says he went far away from his father's house. Now in this parable, the father represents God. Right? And he has sons. So his children represent believers, represent children of God. That would be just like you or me. In this parable, he goes away from the father's house. He gets out of church. He gets away from God. He decides to do things his own way. He wants to have fun. He doesn't want to have anything to do with his father's house. And he goes and he wastes his inheritance and he just goes and, and parties it up. And he has to be brought really low. As a result of all of his sin, he gets brought really low as to be humbled before he realizes, hey, things were actually pretty good in my father's house. You know, people were taken care of in my father's house. When you're, when you're doing the work, when you're obeying the will of God, when you're obeying the will of the Father, hey, he took care of his own. He took care of his servants. He took care of the people in his house. They had enough and to spare. They had enough not just for themselves. They even had enough to, to help other people out, to give to others. They had enough to spare. They, they were doing well. And as people in God's house, I believe that we ought to be generous and also be willing to give. That's something that should identify us as children of God in His house, as people who are willing to help those who are down and out, people who are willing to lend the helping out hand to those in need. But you see, here's the thing. They're going to have to come... And, and in many cases, like with this man, and especially with a brother, with someone who's saved, you know, no one was running out to him in his situation and, and trying to give him the money where he's at. He had to get humbled first and get right and then decide to come back. And hey, you want to come back? Great. We'd love to have you. And this is what we see in this parable. But let's continue on here in verse number 18. Because now he makes this decision in his mind. He says, I will arise and go to my father. And will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. So now, his heart truly has changed now. He, he sees this. He sees the result of his sin. He says, okay, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to my dad. I'm going to go to my father. And I'm going to say, look, I've sinned before heaven and before thee. I'm wrong. And he's going to go and apologize, say, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. Right? You have a great name. I am not worthy to be called your son, but please, you know, you're going to beg with them, just make me as one of thy hired servants. At least just let me work for you. At least let me do this. So he humbles himself. Now, if this ever happens to you, this is, I'm one of the reasons I'm preaching this story, this, this parable, is because 
Look, I don't think anyone in this church is in like that much sin and has just gone out living worldly, but it might happen. It happens to Christians a lot, more often than it should. But people get caught up with the cares of this world, something happens, whatever, they, they get, for whatever reason, they start backsliding, they get out of church, they get away from the house of God, from the house of their father, and start living in the world, and they start backsliding, and ultimately, what that leads to is you're going to start living a more and more sinful life. Now, if you find yourself in that situation, especially if, if God brings you low, because well, He will. He'll humble you. As a son, He's going to discipline you. When you get away from Him, rest assured that you are going to receive the chastening of God in your life. And He may have to bring you down to the gutter to get your attention and to get you to come to yourself as this man did. He had to be brought to feeding the swine and wanting to eat their food before he came to his senses, before he came to himself and said, what am I doing? I need to get back to God. So if this ever happens to you, don't continue to have a stiff neck. Make sure that you do like he did. Come back to God's house because I'll tell you what, God is a God of forgiveness. And the church ought to be a church of forgiveness too. If a brother comes in and they're in church and then they leave, they get into sin, either they have to get kicked out or they leave on their own and they're gone for a while. Hey, when they come back, you know what we're going to do? We're going to receive them. We're going to receive them with open arms and say, come on back in, brother. We're glad that you're back. We're going to rejoice and be happy. Say, hey, this man was dead. He was out in the world. He was living a wicked life. It doesn't matter what he did anymore. It's, it's, it's done. It's over. He repented. He came back. Hey, let's receive him. Let's be loving. Let's not be like the world and turn our backs on him and no one's going to help him out. When they come into his house, when they come into God's house with a humble heart, with a repentant heart, hey, let's show that person forgiveness. Let's make sure that they know they're welcome, that they can find mercy. Now, um, and, and this is important. That's why it's really important at this point. Don't forget that the prodigal son was already a son. He is already saved. He got into sin, but he came back to his father's house with that repentant heart. Verse number 20 says that he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And like I said earlier, the father in this parable represents God. Notice how even though he didn't chase after him, right? When his, when his son wanted to leave, did the father say like, you know, don't go do it, or you know, like, and just and just plead with them and beg with them to stay. No, he said, okay, if that's what you want to do, if you're gonna go, here you go, go ahead and do it. He did it. He went out. Now did the father go chasing after him and saying, come back, come back, we want you. I want you back in my house. No, he didn't. He let him go out and let him do whatever it was that he was gonna do. He had that free will. He didn't make him come back. He didn't try to drag him back. And look, if you're going to start going the opposite direction from God, you know, be careful with that. Because he might just let you go. He might just let you start walking that way. That's what you want to do. But this is also really important to do because what's yeah. important to notice from this story that he was still looking for him. He didn't go out and chase after him. But he was still looking for his son to come back. He was watching for him and waiting for him to come back. Because you see here it says, when he was yet a great way off. The prodigal son is a great way off from his father's house. It says his father saw him. So in order for his father to see him a great way off, he was watching for him. He was looking for him to come back. He wanted him to come back. He didn't want his son to go off and do these things. He didn't want him to go waste his inheritance. But he was still waiting for him and looking for him and praying and hoping that he would come back. It says he had compassion and he ran to him and he fell on his neck and kissed him. He received him back lovingly and just, and just completely willing to come back. And here's the thing. See, a lot of people, when they get into sin and they backslide and they get out of church, a lot of times what's keeping them from coming back is that they're worried about what might happen when they come back. Like they're going to face some kind of consequences. But look at what happened here. Look. You're already paying your consequences. It doesn't say that nothing's going to happen, but God is a loving Father, and He wants you to come back to Him more than anything else. Don't feel a proud attitude or something where, where you know, even though you might not feel worthy, 
He didn't feel worthy to be called a son anymore. And you probably won't either. If you get into that kind of sin, you might be like, man, I'm not even worthy to be in your sight or to be in your presence or to be seen by you. But I'm still going to come back and tell you that and tell you I'm sorry and just please forgive me and let me work for you still. Please use me to do some kind of work. And you know what? God can still use you. Even if you've backslidden, even if you've gotten out of church, even if you've gotten away from him and done all kinds of wickedness and done all kinds of sin and gotten into some really bad sins. Look, if you have a humble heart and you come back to God, he can still use you and he wants you to. He's looking for you to come back. Get back into church. Go back into God's house. He will receive you and he will run to you and meet you halfway. Look what it says in um, James chapter number 4. If you would please turn it. Keep a finger in Luke 15. We're coming right back here. James chapter number 4 verse 8. James 4 8 says, Draw nigh to God. Draw close to God. And he will draw nigh to you. <coughs> Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. This is exactly what happens in this parable. Look, if you decide to draw close to God, you want to draw nigh to God, it says, He's going to draw nigh to you. The prodigal son decided to come back and to get closer to God. He was coming back to God's house. When God sees that, when the Father sees that in this story, He goes running out and He draws close to Him. He's going to meet you there. He'll meet you halfway, but you need to take the first step. You need to start coming back to Him. God will see that and, hey, He's going to love that. He said, come on back home. And He'll receive you back. If you ever find yourself in that position, don't have, excuse me, don't have the wrong attitude. Don't have the wrong heart. Remember that you can go back to God's house. God is a God of mercy. He's a God of forgiveness. He's forgiven you of your sins when you received Christ. When you got saved, when you were born into his family, don't ever think that you can't come back to his house. He will receive you. Don't let that keep you out. Don't let that keep you away from him for longer than you need to be away. Humble yourselves. That's where he says here, look, be afflicted, mourn, weep. Hey, you ought to do those things. When you get away from God and you get in these sins, hey, you ought to be sorry for it. You ought to humble yourself. You ought to weep, be sad, cry, hey, mourn. But you don't have to stay that way. He said, look, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. It's not a pleasant thing. It's not something you should be, you should ignore or, or be happy about or anything like that. He said, look, you've done wrong. Be afflicted, mourn, weep. But that, that, Godly sorrow should turn to repentance. That should make you repent and get right with God. He says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Like this man did. I mean, he humbled himself. He says, look, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. I did wrong. I did, I just please accept me back and let me work for you. It says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Well, look what happens in the story. When, when the father meets him, he has compassion on him. He runs. He falls on his neck. He kisses him. He receives him back home. Verse 21 and the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. He does exactly what he said he was going to do. He confesses it to his father. It says in verse 22, But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be married. So what does he do? His son humbled himself, and the father lifted him up. He lifted him up by giving him the best robe, putting a ring on his hand, giving him shoes on his feet, and killing the fatted, the fatted calf. He does all of this stuff, and, and basically he ends up lifting up his son because he humbled himself, and he came back and got right, and made, and made it right by, by humbling himself and coming back. And so he gets lifted up. Now, <clears throat> earlier in the chapter, we see the same scenario in Luke 15. It was a, it was a separate parable, but basically all of these parables are, are, are tied together in Luke 15. Look at verse number four. This was a parable about the sheep. 
It says, What man of you having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Hey, God is happy when you decide to get right with him. You've got sin in your life. You've got something that you're doing. You know it's wrong. Hey, when you humble yourselves, you get right with God. God loves that. Hey, that's, that's a joyous event when he sees, hey, here's a person that's had this sin in their life, and now you've turned from that sin, you've repented of it, and, and now you're getting right with God. Hey, that makes God really happy. When this happened with the prodigal son, hey, it was a joyous event. It's a reason to celebrate. Say, hey, my son was going the wrong way. He was doing all this stuff, but now he's back. He's doing what's right. He's on the right path. Hey, we're going to celebrate. That is a joyous occasion. And here with the sheep, he's saying the same exact thing. Look at verse number 25. Now we're going to see what the brother thinks of, of his other brother, of the prodigal son, when he came back. It says in verse 25, Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he's, he's out working when all this happens. He was out in the field, and he's doing the work that his father had for him to do. Now he starts coming close, and he hears music, he hears dancing, and he's just like, what's going on? Verse 26 says, And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. So, again, we see the other son. He's the one that did the work. He's the one that's been obeying his father this whole time. His other brother left him, right? The other son, he left. He cut out. He skipped out on the work. So you take it, see this from, from his perspective now, right? The other son. He's thinking, look, I've done all this work. I've been here. I've been doing that which is right. Now I have to do even more work because my brother left. He took his part of the inheritance, which, which cuts into what we could have been doing anyways. He takes that. He leaves. He's gone. You know, he causes all this trouble. But I've been doing that which is right. Now he comes back and you're going to throw a party for him? So this is his perspective. This is what he sees, right? But the father comes out and he entreats for him. The father loves him. He's, he's going to treat for him and explain why the party was justified, why you shouldn't be angry about it. Verse number um, 29 says, And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. See, it is definitely a time for rejoicing, because the sinner turns from his sin. It's a happy time. I mean, he explained it as, look, he was dead. He was doing nothing for God. He had, he had faith without works, right? His faith was dead. He was out there dead. He was doing nothing and accomplishing nothing. But now he's alive again. Now he's coming back. Now he wants to be a servant. Now he wants to do more things for God again. Now he's going to be productive. Now there's, there's a lot more value to his life than before. He said, hey, that's a happy occasion. That's a happy event. Look. And then he explains to him, he says, look, all that I have is thine. You get everything. He wasted his inheritance. That's gone. Okay? We're going to throw him this party because it's happy. We're glad that he's back. We're glad he came back home. We're glad he got right. And now he's here. We're going to forgive him for the things that he's done in the past. And, and we're going to celebrate and be happy that he's back. But guess what's going to happen tomorrow? Okay? The party's over. Fatted calf has been eaten. The music and dancing is going to be done. It's going to be back to work. He had his little party, right? His celebration for, for coming back. And it was a joyous occasion. But you have all of my living now. You've worked. You've done what I wanted you to do. We're going to continue to work and you're going to get it all. 
you're going to get all these rewards because you were faithful, because you stayed true. He's not going to get it. He wasted it in there and said, yeah. Now, his father can still use him. He can still do some works, but he's not going to receive that inheritance. He's not going to get all his rewards. So think about that because we have an inheritance to lay up for ourselves. We have rewards that God will pay us with for our good works. As we mentioned earlier, we're going to get those rewards. But you have to work for them and you have to work hard. God expects you to do the work. Now, if you decide not to do the work, you don't want to do anything for God, well, as the Bible said, you know, if your works are all burned up, yet he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. You're still saved. You're still in heaven, right? Which is great. Amen for that. Amen for all of your sins being forgiven. But if you don't do the work for God, you're going to have no rewards. And you're going to see all these other people getting rewards. And all your stuff, you're going to look at that. And I think it's going to be pretty discouraging if you could say, look, especially if you live a long life and you look back and be like, I had, you know, 70 years 80 years, 80 years, and everything I did just got burned up. It's gone. Nothing. That's going to be kind of sad. You've got to look at yourself, and, and you'll probably be a little bit ashamed of yourself for saying, why did I waste my time? There will be that time you look back and you're like, that stuff's gone. You may, it may be hard to think about that now because you, you're collecting it, you're getting it, you have it in this moment. This moment is going to be gone like that. It's going, to be, it's going to be over and done with. Our time is so precious. It's so, I mean, it flies by. And the older you get, the more you realize how fast time just flies. And you don't have the time to do all the things that you want to do. Make sure, make sure you prioritize your time to what God is going to want you to do with your time. That will lead you to have eternal inheritance. Rewards that can't perish. Rewards that are never going to go away that you'll have with you forever. They're going to last forever. And it's going to be based on the work that you do now. The work that we have set out for us now. And it's not going to be built up along work that you do in one day. Okay? Just say, you can't just say like, well, I spent an entire Saturday doing work for God and I think that's great. Now I'm going to have that reward for the rest of my life and just not do anything ever again. That's going to be nothing. You're going to get these rewards consistently going out all the time and continuing to do the work as his son did here that was receiving the inheritance that God that ended up being the sole inheritor to all of his goods. He was out in the field every day. He's out there working away, working away, slowly, little by little, little by little, having faith, seeing the big picture, stepping back and seeing everything that, you know, from a, from, a back, from a perspective that's just step back a little bit. Yes. Understand that the more work you put in, the more they begin, the, the better your rewards are going to be. And stay focused on the things that, that God considers important, things that are going to get us that eternal, um, that eternal reward, eternal um, value. So um, let's, you know, <clears throat> this story of the prodigal son is a great story. It's something that can encourage you. It's something that's very important. Don't, don't forget this parable. Again, because there, there are people come and go through church. I've seen it in the years that I've been going to church. People come and go. And I pray to God that nobody would ever go out of this church and that we would stay faithful until the day that, that the Lord takes us home. And that's, that's my prayer and wish for everyone that comes to church. But the fact remains that, that that's not going to happen in any church. It, it happens over and over again. People come and people go. And if you are ever that person that ends up, for whatever reason, backsliding, getting away from God's house, getting away from Him, remember this parable and remember it's never too late to come back to God. God will receive you. You just need to be able to humble yourself and, and, and humble your heart and come to your senses and, and say, what am I doing? I'm going to go back there. And I'll let you know, at this church, if you ever, if, if something happens and you're gone, hey, I'm not going to be browbeating you and, and bringing up your past and bringing things up to you. If you come back with a humble heart and you've, and you've fixed whatever that, that area was in your life that was keeping you out of church and that was, that was keeping you away from God, hey, you're going to be welcome back here. 
just remember that. This is this is God's house, and and it's a place where we can forgive our brothers and sisters in Christ, and you're going to be welcomed back in this house if you come back with a humble heart and, and, and repented, and, you're, and you've squared things up with God. And that, that is a promise, and that's very encouraging that we can keep with us. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this parable. I thank you so much for your mercy and your kindness and um, just for loving us and being such a great father. Lord, sometimes we need to be chastened and rebuked, and um, we need to, to be brought low um, when, we, when we have a rebellious attitude and rebellious heart and start thinking that we deserve all these things and we deserve all these rewards and we get bratty and selfish and we want them right now. Lord, help us to have the patience to endure and not to have that type of an attitude. And, and if we ever do, dear God, I pray, I pray that you would please just chasten us as quick as possible so that we could just, just be brought low and, and realize, hey, we need to get back so we don't end up wasting you know, huge portions of our lives being away from you and away from your will, dear Lord, but that we can just get right back on track. And, uh, and we love you, dear God, and we thank you for your mercy and, and your kindness. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.